Good morning, everybody. Good morning. Good morning. Good morning. Sorry, I'm running just a shade late. What's the first number? Three. 259. 259. 259. We'll all stand and sing, Jesus saves. How about that?
Carol Kimbrough made the motion to approve the pat and Pastor Dominic made the second annual. The report was approved as read. Treasurer's report was read by Tom Reeves. Ed Napier made the motion to accept the report and Pastor Dominic gave the second. The report was approved as read. The board was introduced with Eddie Sosby as chairman and members Tom Reeves, Cindy Figueroa, Pastor Dominic, Laura Jones, and Carol Kimmel. <coughs> Julia Houston was also named but what was not present in the meeting. The vision for the board was read by Eddie Sosaby, and he reported that our focus had been on local outreach, music, technology, local activities, and other church activities. Some of the events that has occurred during the year was the retirement reception of Pastor Ed McNeely in May, the fantastic blessing of Pastor Dominic Lydon, his wife Jessica and son Thomas, our homecoming celebration, the fall picnic, which was a great, was a new event and enjoyed by the community community Thanksgiving dinner in the Fellowship Hall, successful efforts to growing our church family, and recognition of Anne McGowan and Doris Jean Farrell for their years of beautiful music that they provided our church as well as their faithfulness. No comments were added by the congregation to the list. Eddie was elected to fill another term and he will remain on the board with Tom Reed, Cindy Figueroa, Carol Kimbrough, Pastor Dominic Lida, and Julia Houston. And the meeting was adjourned. Is there any additions or corrections to the minutes from last year? If not, I ask for a motion to accept. Thank you, and that means that, that uh, this portion of the, the meeting will go back to Tom. Thank you, Ms. Carol. All right, I'm going to bring the I'm served as co-chair with Ms. Julie, and also I do the treasury service for the church. So I was going to bring up and uh, go through the treasury's report for last year. And if you have a copy there, I'm going to go through it. But what I did, and on the left side of the paper was the previous year for 19. I just put that in there so we could give a comparison of where we, what we did last year versus the year before. And I also have a year before that, if you'd like to see, it's just kind of trend how the church is doing, how our finances are going based on the way we hit it with the church. So, okay. We started out the year, I'm on the right-hand column now, but you can compare it to the left if you'd like as we go down, but we're focusing on the right-hand column. And I've lined up the totals across the page. You'll see gaps in the right because we didn't have as many activities, but the total's on the same place as it was on the left, so it should be easy to follow. <clears throat> we started the year out where our mainstay building fund <coughs> That was at the end of, this number's for the end of the year of 20, 12, 31, 20. And that's a, a fund we have in case we get hit with a tornado or any unforeseen natural disasters or stuff like that. We have a little bit of money there just in case on top of what insurance would pay to help us keep the church running and other things. <clears throat> in that account, we had $64,536 at the end of 2020. Uh, just to compare, in 19, we had 62,000, so we had some interest this past year was good to us on that account, and we gained a little bit. Okay, in our checking account for starting January the 1st of 2020, we had $46,732 in the operating account for the church. Our income for the year, our bank interest was $50 for the whole year. We didn't have any donations last year as previous on other years. We had a memorial for Larry Carter. We had $1,480 that was donated in his name. Our tithing was $67,787 for the year. And then the total of all that, total income was $69,317 is what we brought in last year. Okay, going to expenses. Our utilities, our electric bill ran us $1,833 and our water bill $190, which is somewhat less you'll see from the year before, but you got to bear in mind we didn't have church three months during COVID. So that's why it's low. Total utilities is $2,023. Okay, in our miscellaneous spending, we had awards for youth where we keep the plaque names on those plaques for people that have passed and other things. We spent $10 keeping the plaque updated last year. Our daily devotional magazine, which I put the new ones on the uh, offering table today, around $138 for the year. 
Our lawn care was $300 this past year. Our Florida State Annual Report were required to do by the state of Florida was uh, $61. Post office box rental for the church, $92. Our pest control, which is our termite bond to keep the church termite protected, $180. Church office supplies was $279 for the year. We had some electronics and some software go along with our upgrades, I'll talk later, $165. And our insurance for the church ran a $1,715 last year. All right, so our miscellaneous spending was $2,940. Our outreach program, we had a flock notes that we communicate to everybody with out in the, in, out in the uh, electronic world, $579. Our website development management, we spent a good bit here trying to get the website up, get the sermons out, and communicate, try to draw new people into the church. We spent $9,570 in our outreach, in our uh, website development and maintenance. Our Wave 94 pastor sermons that Brother Dominic provides every Sunday on $1,500 for the year. And the homecoming meal that we fed everybody for homecoming was $1,200 for this past year. So the total outreach was $12,849 that the church paid. Our salaries, the pastor's salary, we paid him $12,600 last year. We gave him, there's housing allowance of $25,200. We gave him a Christmas love offering gift for $600 for Christmas. And we had a visiting pastor three times during the uh, Eva Rose I think that's what that was, and that was a $600. We paid about $200 per, per sermon. Our music was $2,350, so our total salaries and housing was $41,350. Total expenses for the year was $59,162. At the end of the year, we had a balance in our operating account for $56,887 that was available. And our total, including our building fund and our ending balance in our operating account was $121,423, which was up about $13,500 from last year's total. So, Lord's being good to us. Amen, get amen on that. Amen. <clears throat> All right. If there's any questions or concerns, now would be a good time if you have anything on the back. Anybody hear anything sounding funny or any way we might get improve it, I'm sure will be interested in hearing. Uh, okay, well, if that's, there's no uh, questions or anything, I'd like to uh, call for a vote on accepting the treasurer's report for 2020. Does anyone would like to? I make that motion. Okay, Ms. Carroll had a motion on it, and I got a second from Mr. Taylor. So that's covered. I appreciate that. And, uh, I try to do my best on it. Sometimes it's pretty challenging, but I do, I do thank y'all. We thank you. Yes, ma'am, thank you. <coughs> All right, our chairperson's report. Okay, after Eddie, Eddie Soulsby was our chairman, and he resigned. So we really didn't have a good way. We didn't, at the time that happened, it was kind of, you know, very on the point when it happened, it wasn't a lot of notice, you know, it was just, I, I don't want to be the chair anymore. So, Miss Julia Houston that plays the organ and myself got together and we didn't either one want to be the chair, so, but we did decide that we would co-chair it. And that seemed to be working pretty good so far. I, I've not had any regrets of you. I think it's working fine. And we've been co-chairing the meetings and Miss Julia also is the secretary as I'm the treasurer. And we've been keeping electric. We, and they, we kept the elected officers, the secretary and treasurer office, respectively, with our co-chair. And that hasn't seemed to have been an issue so far. I think that's working out good. Uh, the Lord has blessed Mission by the Sea in a lot of ways this year. To name a few, we got some new members. And most of those, from the best I can tell, has been from the website. Most people have found our church on the website, and they tell us when they come. That's, that's what's bringing them here. It's not so much people. It's going out on the internet and finding a church and they've been coming. We've had a lot of visitors. We've had some good volunteers. A lot of people stepped up this year and helped out. Like I was saying, our financials improved over 19 to 20 up, you know, $13,500. That was a pretty good improvement. Uh, the year before we had come up, uh, 
about $28,000. So, I mean, the Lord's really blessing this church. You know. uh, our board's vision. We have a vision for the board. And the mission by the sea and the sea will be a Christ-centered church serving the Lord seven days a week while being relevant to the community in service and technology. And I really think that technology is having a lot to do with what's helping us get this where we're going. I mean, we weren't seeing it until we made changes, and now we're starting to see. Our board's focus for the past year was survival in a time of COVID-19. I mean, three months of no church, that was tough. It really was. But to be honest with you, our tithing was higher this year than it was last year, and we didn't have church three months, so tell me what the Lord's doing. That is really great. A priority list of action areas for the past year were our music. We lost Miss Joanne Taylor. She went up to West Virginia, and I actually talked to her on Friday on the way home from work. I got thinking about her, and I called her on the phone. She answered in just a minute, and she was, oh, I wish I was in Florida. It's so cold up here. And she said her or her son hadn't been able to get out of the driveway for over a week because of trees down, ice everywhere. They live up on the side of a mountain, and he hadn't even been able to go to work for over a week. Mm -hmm. So anyway, she said, boy, panacea sure didn't look good right now. <laughs> so we added Miss Glenda Price. She stepped up to help us, you know, and uh, we got Miss Floyd, Cersei, which they're not here today, to help us with the music. The times when I need to be out, a lot of times I have to work a lot of crazy hours, and Floyd's very, very calling me every week, wanting to know if he needs to come. I think he likes to do it as much as I do. <laughs> so. Our technology and church promotion at our our contract with Wave, that's Wave 94 radio, was canceled and the sermons <clears throat> returned to Pastor Dominic. We're working with Oyster Radio, up and out of Pastor, if I get out of line here. We're working with Oyster Radio, it's a local station out of Appalachicola, right? Mm -hmm. To uh, broadcast our sermons and provide information about the time our sermons will be broadcast. So basically what we're doing, we're getting out of the Tallahassee radio station into a more local radio station with a similar same type of deal, right? But we're going to get a lot more exposure, I'm hearing. Mm -hmm. And Pastor Dominic thinks it will bring us a lot more from the weekend people that are at these beaches around here versus <clears> people <throat> that are not, you know, we got a lot of our stuff coming when people are down here on vacation. Okay. Uh, Rob and Nancy Leinbarger, Barger, excuse me, have been working to improve our technology with our video and our putting our information onto the website, which I know y'all have gone on the web and looked, and you can see any sermon pretty much there is just available to you on the website. And uh, that's a great thing. It's really improved our technology to help us identify. <coughs> We're trying to work towards live streaming, is that right? We aren't quite there yet, but we're trying to investigate how we can get this to be live and also be recorded and available on the website as we're going to have to provide some Wi-Fi in the church and we're out investigating what's that going to take to be able to have people to be able to watch it live versus still be able to do it when they can't get to it later. They can watch it online at their leisure. So that's where we're headed with that. Our website is fully operational and it gets updated every week and it's working well for us. And if anybody needs to communicate or a prayer list or anything like that, you can contact Ms. Carol. She's in constant contact with the person that manages it. And we'll get it on there and get it out and communicate. We also use flock notes. You get a lot of text on your phone and sometimes emails. It says about updates to the church, what we're going to preach on Sunday, prayer requests, announcements, good news, babies, whatever, you know, anything. It all goes out on the flock notes. You should get it on your phone. If you aren't getting it, contact Miss Carol. She gets you set up. And you'll start getting all that stuff. It's a great way to communicate. Tell us what sermon's going to be, any kind of changes in, you know, pertinent things that affects the church. I'm going to move into some highlights for the year. We got stable finances, which is a great thing. Building, we, uh, went and built a ramp for Miss Connie Bowers. Uh, I don't know if everybody knows her, but she kind of has a lot of trouble. She can't walk, she had a wheelchair, I mean, for a while. I think she walked her type now, right? Mm -hmm. yeah. She's using the ramp and is grateful for it. Yeah, she, she couldn't get in her house. So, I mean, we really have helped her a lot and she's very appreciative of sending a thank you card to the church and everything. We also have placed the gutters on the church here 
in the church, and they were really in worse shape than we thought once we got them down. It was a great thing we did because it really saved us from having some problems with the church. We got new gutters, and we also got some new style leaf guards on there now to keep keep them clean. And it's been keeping. And we also cleaned and painted the fascia boards, and that was done by Pat O'Hearn, and that was a big improvement. And that's been a pretty good while. And if you look outside, they're staying pretty clean. There are a few little things on them, but not like they used to be. They're, they're way better. We repaired the emergency exit doors here on the left and the right. I don't know if any people are aware that we have ways to get out if you had to get out in emergency. They're here on both sides. Well, before we couldn't even get the doors open. They were froze up and painted shut. And anyway, we went through and got them both working now. And you can actually bring a wheelchair through that one. And it's the same level outside, don't even need a ramp. You can just bring a person right through that door and get them into the church. Uh, I, I worked myself, I helped uh, Pat O'Hearn, and Pat was great carpenter. Had some good ideas, worked on the church door where you go into the fellowship hall when you first come in. There was some big issues, he got that taken care of. And uh, he really helped us a lot. The church closed in March and we didn't reopen until mid-May. There was a three months I was telling y'all we didn't have church because of COVID. Yeah. <clears throat> Our cleaning protocols at the church services after church and other organizations meeting in the fellowship hall, if you've been noticing, once we get through, there's some volunteers go through, wipe every pew, everything that anybody had touched, they wipe it down. They do the same after the AA meetings they have here on Saturdays. Any kind of meetings, fire department, it's all cleaned every time they leave. That's part of the deal. And that's work, been working well. We had a COVID-19 testing site out in the church parking lot previously, back earlier in the year, where you could come by and get testing stuff. But we had the birth of Eva Rose, Pastor Dominic's little girl. We continued to use the flock notes, which has been a big, big communicating tool for the church. We launched our website, and Ms. Melissa Jacks is helping us provide the technical support for it. Has been doing a wonderful job for us and got us up and going. And I don't know if y'all look on there, but you're, you're, you're missing out. There's a, there's a lot of information on that website. <clears throat> we have the ability to record Dominic's recorded sermons on the website. That started in March. So they've been on there almost a year now, getting close. Mm -hmm. The cancellation of our fall festival community Thanksgiving <laughs> gathering, we didn't, we decided it was a lot of risk. We didn't have our Thanksgiving dinner as normal because of the COVID and it just, we, we'll have to regroup and going forward when it feels like it's right, we will be sure we have that. Ms. Glenda Price and Mr. Floyd, like I mentioned earlier, joined in helping with music and any kind of communicating from the praise, we sure appreciate that. Miss Julia and Miss Glenda work it out, and Miss Miss Julia preaches, uh, plays it. I don't know. I mean, two or three churches. And uh, when she's gone, Miss Glenda picks up the slack, so it works up just right. Uh, we have no reports of viruses coming from our church. None. We have no reports of anybody getting virus from church. So we, I think, we're doing a good job. Everything's been great. Okay, moving over to outreach, our discretionary outreach donations focus on local needs. We based our donations on 10% of the offerings of the church receives. <clears throat> and just some of the things we've done, we had 4-H after school program in Panacea for some kids that just don't get anything to eat. They're not, you know, they're not very privileged people and we provided dinners to them. <clears throat> and that was happening back in March. We have the Al Alzheimer's Respite Program, which is a, uh, help me with that a little bit, Ms. Judy. I don't understand that. It's, it's uh, a day out for the for the, the families to have there someone to help care with their, with their patients. Okay, all right. We have H.A. Smith's Drug Habilitation Program. Once it starts, we, we plan on participating in that for drug rehab program. We'll call medical centers patients who need services and can't afford it. Local families with financial needs, such as food, utility, shelter, etc. We pay for those bills. <clears throat> we don't give them money, we just take care of the bills. A local AA group in the Alligator Point Fire Department, volunteer fire department needs. We've been trying to partner with them a little bit, and they partner with us. Okay, so now some topics for the congregation. It's an opportunity now would be a good opportunity to hear from y'all. 
Are there any topics or concerns or issues or matters to any of you would like to bring up at this annual meeting that everybody else could hear? Pretty quiet. Okay. I'm trying not to overwhelm you with everything at once. We would like to get the church input on resuming the fellowship time after our Sunday morning services. Are there any thoughts of this? If that's good or bad or too early? Amen. I don't want to do it. Yeah. All right. I'm all about it too, but I know we got to be careful and maybe just phase into it a little by little. Don't just go full blast like we were. So <laughs> anyway, you got those notes. That was good. I think everybody kind of felt like, <clears throat> I'll tell you what, let me call for a motion on resuming those fellowship times. We take a vote on it. And would anybody like to uh, recommend? Make a motion. You do make a motion and we we'll start having our yeah. fellowship time. We got a second from Mr. Taylor. And perhaps passion, so that'll cover that. All right, we got another opportunity. We're looking for somebody or some people to start handling our website and flock notes. We're just trying to get it a little closer to home. We have people helping us, but the people are not local. We've allotted money in the 2020 budget to have the website developed and updated on a weekly basis and send out flock notes at least <coughs> weekly. We're looking for volunteers to be our webmaster. If you got anybody that's got good computer skills, it doesn't take a whole lot. It's pretty much set up. It's just a management function. It'd just be, you know, adding data and everything's already set up. If anybody's interested, please let a board member know and we would be happy to talk to you. We're just trying to get it a little closer to home so we can get it done quicker than, you know, the delay of dealing with someone that's not in town. If not, right now, y'all can just think about it. No further input. We'll move to a final matter on today's agenda. It will be election of board members to fill vacant seats. The Board of Trustees offers the names of Ms. Nancy Linebarger and Ms. Jeannie Taylor to fill vacancies on the board. Uh, both of them expressed interest and would like to participate if the church would like for them to help us. And we'd like to enter to get, introduce them, Ms. Jeannie Taylor, would just raise your hand, everybody can see you. Then up. Mm -hmm. And I've got Ms. Nancy Lineberger back there right behind you. Uh, we didn't receive any nominations from anybody at the church during the open nomination period of January 17th through February. So, uh, are there any discussions of this motion after discussion? I mean, anybody okay? Everybody okay with it? Anybody got any issues? All right. Well, I'm going to call for a vote. All in favor of accepting Ms. Nancy Linebarger as a member of the Press of Trustees, raise your hand. All opposed. All right. If any opposition can't be, okay, excuse me. All right. All in favor of assessing, accepting Ms. Jeannie Taylor as a member of the Board of Trustees, raise your hand. All opposed. Looks like motion carries on both. Everything's good. <clears throat> if no further business to bring up, anybody got anything, this is your last chance. If you got anything you'd like to bring up, that'd be a good time. All right. Sounds like everybody's satisfied. No further business to bring to the group, so we will adjourn. Will you give me a motion to adjourn. Anybody want to call I for a motion? motion to All right. Anybody would like to second that? Miss Glenna? And all in favor, opposed, this say aye. aye. All right. Well, the meeting will be closed. Mm -hmm. We do appreciate it. I'm sorry I do a better job. I do the best I can. You did great. But I appreciate it. <laughs> if you need a copy of the uh, budget and there's not one on the table, just see me. I do have a few more here in my folder, and I'd be more than happy to provide you with one. I do want you to be understanding what we're doing with the money the Lord's bringing to us. He's been really good to us this year. and church is really headed the right direction we just want to try to grow it best we can i mean we struggle for people but we're in a situation we're dealing with really vacationing people and that season is now upon us so it's a good opportunity to bring some people in the church and try to see if we can get them saved thank you all thank you Mr. again to everyone we're uh, happy to have uh Everyone here this morning, I want to do just a quick uh, update on some of our prayer list. 
and also to remind everyone here that we do have a library back in the nursery area and it has some new items on it so uh, if you uh, feel like that you need something to read during the week uh, just take a little browse through the, the library and take a look at the books that are there. Uh, also I want to uh, remind everyone that Margie uh, is at home. She has had her knee surgery. She is struggling with uh, the therapy that they are having her to do. So just pray for Margie's well-being her, and her health. We just want her to be back and, and be in our congregation with us. So remember Margie. Also, uh, I would like to ask everyone to pray for uh, our country, for the weather that we have had, and it's been devastating to so many families. And um, our young lady, Maddie, who is now out in training in Texas, has had just a little snippet of that because they haven't even been given their uniforms because the weather hasn't permitted them to be uh, hardly out of the classroom because their dorms have not had good heat. So just keep Maddie in your prayers as well because uh, she's our uh, little girl grown up and gone out into the world. Uh, also, we want to uh, thank Tom for uh, presenting uh, our annual board meeting and for all of us to pray that as we go forward into 2021 that we just give our church and our families to the Lord and thank the Lord for all that he has given to us this past year and the ability to have such a warm church. Also, don't forget Bible study at 6 o'clock on Wednesday night. Uh, we have a new icon on the website. You can go on there and keep up with us if you're not able to attend. So take a peek at the website and look at the uh, website for our Bible studies. And we will uh, anticipate you joining us as you can. And if not, stay in touch with us through the, through the website. Uh, Pastor Dominic, I'm going to turn it over to you. Okay. Well, good morning, good morning. Good morning. Good morning. I was just over there, just itching away, ready to preach. Oh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, we, we always got to be transparent and, and be open with what's going on in our church. And one thing that's really, really struck our hearts and just being, you know, just a lot of gratitude and that our finances in our church have been growing the last several years. And sometimes it can be hard when you look at the uh, amount of people or lack thereof that somehow we feel that our church isn't going in the right direction. And I want you to always remember the story in John chapter 4 where Jesus went into Samaria and sat on a well and waited for one woman. And if one woman is good enough for Jesus, then one person should be good enough for us. You never know who you reach and how you can reach them with the gospel message. And that's what we're looking to do here. We're, we're looking to be biblical at this church like this church has always been. And we're looking to grow um, people in this church in the Lord and disciple them further as well as being able to have outreach in our community. So we're so thankful that, that our finances have, have almost nearly doubled from year to year. And that's a really good thing. We're so thankful for the people who've given into this ministry year after year and believe in what's going on here. And so keep that in your prayers that we're, we really want to bring people into this church and and disciple them and, and exalt the cross of Jesus Christ. And I tell you what, this morning I, I really want to kind of wrap up our series that we've been doing in Luke chapter 9. It's, it's been a good three or four weeks in this particular passage. Uh, next Sunday we're going to start a new series on heaven. We're going to start a series on what is heaven like. Where do Christians go when they die? Do they immediately go into the presence of God? How are we going to relate to each other in heaven? So I've got about a four or five week series that we're just going to do on heaven alone. And so that's going to be pretty exciting. But uh, this morning, if you take your Bibles back to Luke chapter 9, I have a tendency and I, I love to do so. I love to read the word of God. No matter how many times I read the same passage, there is just something about God's word that really grips my life and it should yours as well and so i always like to read the same passages before we kind of open up that way we can kind of get a grip of what's going on in luke chapter 9 we'll be reading verses 23 through 26 and we'll kind of leave our series by focusing in on the last verse verse 26 but verse 23 says this and he said to them all 
If any man will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross daily and follow me. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, the same shall save it. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his Father's and of the holy angels. Lord, we're thankful once again for your word that is true. It's inspired by you. There are no errors, no fallacies, no mistakes. It is sure. It is stable. It stands the test of time. It gives us encouragement. It gives us grace, mercy, understanding wisdom to live our daily lives in light of your glory. We thank you for our church. We thank you for the way that you are blessing us. We pray that you would give us a broad vision to reach our community, that you would give us a broad vision of outreach, and Lord, that you would keep our feet heading towards <coughs> preaching the gospel to never turn back, to never look back, but to always exalt the cross. We ask, Lord, that you would just give us clarification and understanding of what's in your word, and that you would change our lives minute by minute and day by day. Lord, that our lives would be a passionate pursuit of your holiness and who you are. Let us decrease and you increase. Let us be full of you. Let there be less of self. We love you. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You know, we have been in this series for several weeks, and I know Sunday after Sunday, I, I have literally just kind of hammered away at the fact that I believe that the contemporary evangelical message is slightly skewed. And what I meant by that is, you know, what we've been talking about is that here Jesus gives this radical gospel invitation to thousands of people and it almost sounds like a works-based system that if you are going to follow Jesus, there are some requirements. You have to deny yourself. We looked at what that meant. It literally means there must be an attitude of self-suicide, if you will, that you must disown yourself and you must take everything that you are, lay it at the feet of Jesus, and you must apply everything that Jesus is to your life. It is that John the Baptist term, let me decrease and let him increase. We saw this radical invitation here that you must take up your cross daily. And that is the instrument of death, the instrument of execution, that following Jesus could cost your life. And the principle here is that you must be willing to give your life. The principle in all of these verses is the, the willing attitude to, to disown yourself, to follow Christ, to surrender to Him as Lord. And that's the gospel that Jesus presented. And that is radically different than the modern message that we hear today. It's all about self-help, self-satisfaction, make the sinner comfortable, make people feel like they're okay, build up their egos, and the list goes on and on and on. That's not the message of the gospel. The message of the gospel that Jesus taught was a message of suffering and sacrifice and lordship to him. And one of the things that I, I really get aggravated to no end is that I really hear this message all the time from, from pastors and, and teachers of Scripture, people that have mega churches is they really project Jesus and they view Jesus. They, they portray Jesus as this frustrated, helpless, would-be redeemer who's literally standing in heaven with his hands tied behind his back and just hoping that people will accept his message. 
He's just hoping that people will just wake up and come to their senses and know that He is Lord. And sometimes modern evangelists, they just portray Jesus as this frustrated Redeemer that can't get anybody to surrender to Him as Lord. Uh, you hear it all the time. If you just kind of read between the lines when people preach. And I think one of the reasons why is there's this grave misinterpretation of Revelation 3.20. And we went through the, uh, most of Revelation, the first four chapters, we did about a three-month series in there. And you remember Revelation chapter 3, verse 20, uh, he's talking to his church. And that verse that people love to use is where Jesus says, I stand at the door and knock. And, and we use that verse, well, evangelists use that verse to say that poor little helpless Jesus is standing outside of the door of the human heart just waiting and itching to come in if someone will just invite Him. And it's a grave, bad misinterpretation of that verse. The context there is referring to the church, the cold, callous church that says they identify with Christ he is actually standing outside of his church that identifies and bears his name. What a shame that Christ can't even come into his own church, a church that bears his own name. That's the whole context of Revelation 3.20. It has nothing to do with an individual. It has to do that that church was cold and calloused, was not spiritual at all. But we've kind of taken that verse and, and evangelists use it in their their, their aisle invitations, they use it in their hand-raising invitations. You hear it all the time. And I want to tell you, that's not what that scripture teaches. And we've kind of portrayed Jesus as kind of waiting for an invitation from us. Oh, we've kind of reversed the radical message of the gospel. It's, it's now Jesus is waiting for an opportunity from us. He's standing quietly outside of our heart until we make the decision to invite him in. And you've heard that message over and over and over. But I want to tell you, in reality, the gospel message is not Jesus proclaiming to people and suggesting to people to come to him. It is a command. It's a call. When Jesus says repent or perish, that's not a suggestion. That is a divine command to humanity to repent. That is Jesus is the one inviting, not us inviting him. Well, we get that reversed a little bit because we have a tendency to try to make the gospel a little bit more easier than it actually is and therefore modify the message to suit the masses and to make sinners comfortable and say it just depends on them. Well, if that was the case, no one would get to heaven because it's an impossibility for sinners who are spiritually dead to awaken themselves out of their own deadness and to bring life out of deadness. There's no way that spiritually dead sinners can awaken themselves. They can't just open their ears. They can't just open their blind eyes. They can't just open their heart. There must be a work of the Spirit of God awakening the heart of a spiritually dead sinner. And that is the call from heaven to the sinner's heart. Not the sinner's heart to heaven. And that's where I think that modern evangelical Christianity has really got off base when you look at how Jesus presents the gospel in the New Testament he is the inviter he is the one who confronts sinners he's the one who challenges them he's the one that calls them and commands them to come to him to believe in him to turn from their sins and embrace him as Lord he is the inviter he is the sovereign inviter and this is at the heart of the gospel that Jesus preached and you know what, as you look through the scriptures, if you look at the individual stories in the Gospels, you know what you'll find? You'll find exactly that. You'll find in the Gospel of Matthew chapter 4, you'll find that Jesus, Messiah, is walking on the shoreline and he approaches a, a group of brothers. 
who are running a family business, a fishing business, and they're in the midst of running a fishing industry, a fishing business, and, 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 and do the brothers, do they say, hey, there's Jesus, I want to follow him. That's not what took place in that story. It's the exact opposite. Jesus said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. And do you know what the response was? They dropped everything and followed Jesus. Or what about Matthew? Matthew who wrote his gospel, who was a tax collector, a publican. He was the most despicable person in Jewish culture because he had sold out his own uh, people uh, to Rome to, to take taxes from his own Jewish brethren and make Rome rich. Do you know what Matthew says? Jesus came into the town, saw Matthew as a tax collector and a publican, and Jesus said, follow me. <clears throat> and guess what Matthew did? Left everything. Left his profession, left his business, left everything, and followed Jesus. So what about Luke chapter 19? Luke chapter 19, you see Zacchaeus hears that Jesus is coming in town. And what does little Zacchaeus do? Small of stature, he climbs up the tree, wants to get a little view of who Jesus is. Do you remember the story? Quite frankly, Jesus comes in the town and it says Jesus looked up. Which means that Jesus is the one who saw Zacchaeus. And do you remember the exact words that Jesus said? The King James says that Jesus told Zacchaeus to make haste and come down. Once again, that is the call. That is Jesus as the inviter. I mean, every story you see, that's what it is. Even Saul on the road to Damascus. Jesus is the inviter every single time. We have, we have reversed the role of Jesus in proclaiming the gospel as poor, helpless, little Jesus who can't save people. And I want to tell you, He can. And He does. And when you are saved, you will know you're saved because you will walk away from everything that identifies with self. And when we're saying and using the word that you drop everything, everything, all that denotes is anything that has a grip on you that is part of you. You have to give that up. That is part of self-denial. All of the glories of this world, all of the glories of success, whatever it is that competes with you surrendering to Jesus as Lord, that must go. That has to go. And you saw that so quickly in some of these stories with uh, people leaving the lucrative businesses to follow Jesus as Lord. That's what's happening all through the gospel. When I read Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, that's what I see. I see Jesus the inviter. I see Jesus sitting on the well in Samaria waiting for a woman to come to him so he can invite her to eternal life. Uh, we have this notion that the pastor is supposed to, at the end of the service, give this great monumental altar call and get everyone down to the altar and weeping and crying. And therefore, we can just count the heads and say, you know what? Today, 10 people got saved. I just don't think that's the way salvation works. I'm sorry. I think it's the work of the Spirit of God and the heart of man. And I think that it can occur anywhere at any time. I don't think it's necessarily attached to an altar or a church building. If that's the case, then everyone that got saved in the Gospels, they must not have been saved because there was no altars, no church buildings. It was nothing but open air preaching and proclamation from Jesus and a call to repent and they came by the thousands. We've reversed that message a little bit. Jesus gives this invitation for us to lose ourselves in order to gain Christ. I just never want to be a person or a pastor or a teacher who modifies the message and makes it so easy that people assure themselves that they're saved because of something I've told them that they need to do. 
That business of salvation has nothing to do with me. It has nothing to do with anybody in the church. The business of salvation has to do with the sinner and heaven alone. There's no mediator between the sinner and heaven except for one, and his name is Jesus Christ our Lord. But sometimes the pastor can put himself in the middle of that. He can tone the message down. He can make it easy and comfortable for the sinner so much so that the sinner actually convinces themselves that they're saved when they know all along they're lost. It's so important to give people the truth. And let me put this in clear terms if I can. The real reality, the real issue of salvation comes down to the word shame. That's why this verse is here in verse 26. For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words, of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed when he shall come in his own glory and in his fathers and of the holy angels. The real issue of salvation comes down to the issue of shame. And that is that, are you ashamed to identify with Jesus? Are you ashamed to identify with the gospel? Are you ashamed to identify with who Jesus claims to be? Because if you are, then there's no hope. If you are ashamed of, of identifying with Jesus, Jesus is saying here that if you're ashamed today, here, presently, in this life, then He will be ashamed of you in the next life. And that The whole issue of salvation comes down to this. Those who are ashamed of themselves, those who are penitent, those who have a, a repentant attitude and embrace their true condition as desperate and crushed under the weight of the law of God and understand their real condition, that they're sinful and wretched and wicked, guilty before God, doomed. Those people, that are ashamed of themselves and how they have lived, those people alone are the only ones that have real hope. Because it's once you understand who you are that you're able to reach your hand out and say, God, rescue me. It's the people who are not ashamed of their sinful life, the people who are not ashamed of living 30, 40, 50, 60 years in the face of God's law and, and never asking God for forgiveness. It's the people who, who live their entire lives and shake their fists at God and say, you will not rule and reign over my life. It's the people that live their entire lives and say there is no God, no such thing as intelligent design. They have no shame for anything they have ever done. Those people have no hope unless they're broken, unless they're ashamed of how they live. That's what this verse is coming down to. And in fact, if you look back up in verse 22, the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected of the elders and chief priests and scribes and be slain and be raised the third day. The whole issue with the religious leaders, we often like to portray the religious leaders as people who sought out Jesus and crucified him because they were just so offended with who he was. And that is right. But let me dig a little bit deeper down. Uh, the real reason why the religious leaders crucified Jesus is because they were ashamed of him. You see, he was the one that claimed to be Messiah. He was the one that claimed to be the son of David, come down from heaven in the lineage of David in that kingly line and therefore if he is from that kingly line and he has come down from God and he is Messiah and he is king and he is Lord then why would he not relieve the Jews from the oppressors from Rome? I mean Passion Week he's riding in Jerusalem on a donkey? That's not what a king looks like. That's, that's not what a, a champion of the people looks like. And, and I want to tell you what happened. These religious leaders continued to reject him because they would not have him as king. Because they looked at him and they saw humble, meek, 
docile, nonviolent Jesus preaching a message of repentance to the people and they could not identify with that as Messiah. No way. He will never rule over us as king. Just look at him. He sits down and eats with publicans and prostitutes. No way he will rule and reign over us. Now Jesus, like Paul says so many times, became a stumbling block to the Jews. That's what he literally was. He was a stumbling. They just couldn't get past this humble, meek man who never did any ill will to anybody. All he did was love. All he did was preach forgiveness. All he did was preach love. And they put him on a cross and crucified him because they were ashamed they would never claim him to be Messiah, too humble, too meek. And all on the way, all he did was call out their hypocrisy. Called out their hypocrisy in giving, that they were doing it for self-gain. He called out their hypocrisy in prayer. He called out their hypocrisy in everything. Their prayer life was hypocritical. Their giving life was hypocritical. Their fasting was hypocritical. And all Jesus did was confront that and call them to repentance. I don't know if you remember Luke chapter 4, but several chapters over, Jesus goes back into his hometown in Nazareth. Where that is his synagogue. He's been in that town for 30 years. He's been going to that synagogue. Every Sabbath, he's been participating in that synagogue. Jesus was Jewish. His Jewish roots were alive and well as he walked as Messiah. He, he goes into this synagogue every Sabbath for 30 years. He's in, the, in this Jewish synagogue with, with all of his friends and extended family members and people he's known his entire life. People he's grown up with. And you know what he does? For the first time in 30 years, he stands up and preaches one sermon and they literally want to throw him off of a cliff and kill him. Because of one sermon. His extended family, his friends and people that he grew up with wanted to kill him for one sermon he preached and throw him off the cliff because you know what he did? He called them to repentance. And they were not ashamed. They were not broken. They were not humble and contrite. They didn't hear the message because the people in that synagogue believed that they were already righteous by their own works and therefore they wanted to kill Jesus. They had convinced themselves. One sermon. And that's where it really eventually comes down to, to be honest with you. It's, it's whether or not you're ashamed of Jesus or you're ashamed of yourself. And that's really what it comes down to. I mean, all stuff laid aside. And that's the real issue. Now turn over to Hebrews chapter 2. just kind of want to fly through a couple of these verses. Hebrews chapter 2, it's... That word ashamed kind of picks up a lot here in the book of Hebrews. I'm going to show you the most important scripture. Why don't you kind of stop and think about this? It's just so powerful. Hebrews chapter 2, verses 10 and 11. For it became him, it's referring to Jesus, for whom are all things. And by whom are all things, and bringing many sons unto glory, to make the captain of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For both he that sanctifies and they who are sanctified are all one, for which cause he is not ashamed to call them brethren. Stop right there. You know, in Christianity, we, we understand that great truth, the foundation that our faith stands on, and that's the Trinity. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Three persons, yet one God. 
And we always identify as Jesus as God in the flesh. And we worship him as Lord. We worship him as God. We worship him as sovereign creator. But do you know what happens in this verse? The Lord kind of levels the playing field in so much that he kind of steps out of that God role, if you will. And he identifies with saved people as their brothers. Just stop and think about that. All of the sin we've ever done in our life, every thought that's been against God, every action that's been against God, every good thing that we have left undone that has been against God, every word that we've spoke, every attitude that we have had, you would think that a holy God would be ashamed of us. And you know what Jesus says here? No, those are my brothers, and I'm not ashamed of them. Now, if you reverse it, and you think about sinful humanity, wicked humanity, that's not even willing to surrender their life to a Lord who died on the cross for them, but the Lord is saying here, if the roles were reversed, you've lived a sinful life, you've lived a wicked life, you've lived a wretched life, and you're all guilty before God. And what we should really do is execute judgment on you. And Jesus says, no, I'm not ashamed to identify with sinful humanity that has been saved as my brother. I mean, that's just a remarkable, remarkable verse there. I mean, just nothing but an amazing act of grace that the second person of the Trinity would identify us as his brethren, identifying with our humanity, and then saying that he is not ashamed of us. Hebrews 11. Kind of further down into the Trinity. Hebrews chapter 11 down in verse 16. This is that chapter we love to we call it the hall of faith. Almost like the hall of fame in Christianity. But this is the hall of faith. These are all the great men and women who live for God. And down in verse 16 it says, But now they desire a better country that is a heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he has prepared for them a city. Uh, God the Father. So we have in Hebrews chapter 2, we have Jesus the Son, the second person of the Trinity, saying, listen, those who have come into the kingdom, I'm not ashamed to identify with them as my brethren. And here you have God the Father saying the same thing. I'm willing to say that sinners who have repented and come to an acknowledgement of who they are and exercise saving faith, I am not ashamed to say they are mine. That's grace. Because he should not be saying that. Holy God should be saying to sinful humanity, you're guilty and therefore a judgment is an eternal hell. But Jesus the Son and God the Father are saying that this is an act of amazing grace. This is, this is marvelous grace at work. Because I want to tell you, even as a Christian of 20-something years, I know I easily bring shame on the name of Christ sometimes. Oh, we would have our heads stuck in the sand to believe that we don't. Some of the things that we say, some of the attitudes that we have, some of the thoughts that we have, some of the ways that we greet people in a nonchalant manner and really don't care about who they are or what they're going through in their lives. We easily bring reproach on Christ. But yet Christ still says, I love them, God. The Father still says, I'm not ashamed to call them mine. Go over to Hebrews chapter 12 just continues to go. Yet the world still shames Christ. 
Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1 and 2. It says, Wherefore, seeing we also are compassed about with so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and the sin which does so easily beset us, and let us run with patience the race that is set before us. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, look at this next phrase, despising the shame, and is set down at the right hand of the throne of God. And right here, what you see very clearly is that when Jesus went to the cross, even though it was a gruesome death, even though it was a miscarriage of justice in every way, even though it was horrific in every way, He went to that cross with joy because He knew the end of Him dying would open up heaven's doors to receive center, sinners in paradise. And, and so doing so, He despised the shame. And what that's referring to is all the world has ever had for Jesus, people that are outside the kingdom, all they have ever done is shame him. You remember what they were doing before he died? They were walking back and forth, and what were they doing? Wagging their heads, pointing at him. If you really are the Christ, the Son, why don't you come down off of this cross? Just putting him to an open shame. Strangely enough, they're mocking him and shaming him, but he's dying for them at the same time. Just an amazing act of grace, and I think that's why those words come rolling off of his tongue when he's looking down at the mob who are screaming for his blood, and he says, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. What are they doing? They're shaming him. They have no clue what they're really doing. Yet Jesus, an amazing act of grace, is willing to lay his life down. And you know what? Every sinner that rejects the gospel when you present it, that you're still shaming Christ. It's like they're crucifying Christ afresh. Every time that message is resisted and rejected. You know, when I really think about what a Christian is, I really think about a Christian as someone who is not ashamed of Christ. You know that? That's what a real Christian is. Someone who's not ashamed of Jesus. Someone who's able to stand in their workplace under a hostile environment with other religious preferences prevalent and still able to stand on their faith and in a gracious way tell people that they love Jesus. That they love Jesus, that they've surrendered their life to Jesus, that they're forgiven for their sins, and they can have that same life. I mean, if you really think about it, that's what a Christian is, someone who's not ashamed. And, and if you think about what an unbeliever is, an unbeliever is someone who is ashamed to identify with Christ and His words. You know, I think that's real peculiar how that's, Placed in Luke 9, verse 26, he says, if you're ashamed of me and my words. You know what I think he was going after there? There's a lot of people in this world, world that love to admire Jesus from a distance. <coughs> you know that? There's a lot of people that just love to say, you know, Jesus was a great man. He was a spiritual guru. He was the best prophet out of all of the other prophets of all the other religions. And people just love to admire Jesus from a distance. But the minute you start putting his words in play, oh, they have a whole nother view of who Jesus is. The scripture is too narrow. It's too black and white. It's too straightforward. I, I admire the man Jesus, but I don't think I can really get on board with being so narrow and so black and white and so this is the way I have to live my life. I think I'll live my life the way I want to live it and not be shamed for anything I've ever done and still admire Jesus. Well, guess what? It doesn't work that way. If 
you take Jesus, you have to take the gospel that he preached. You can't just take the man without the message. You have to take both together. You know what? Our culture is really good about making that disconnection. You have to be real careful because that's what a lot of people will do. They'll say, I love Jesus, but I don't love the words. Well, you have to take both. I thought about why people would be ashamed of Christ. I mean, what would they be ashamed of? He lived a perfect life. He was holy. He was just. He was righteous, had all wisdom, all power, all intuition. I mean, what was there to be ashamed about who Jesus was? Well, I'll tell you, one of the reasons why people run the opposite way is because when you do get closer and closer to Jesus, you get closer and closer to the light. And what does the light do? The light exposes people's evil deeds. It's John chapter 1. He came to his own and his own received him not. Why? Because the light exposes people's evil deeds. And I'm going to give you some of those evil deeds. Why people will not come to Christ because the love of self, the love of sin... The love of acceptance, the love of money. Here's a big one. The love of being accepted in your own chosen group of sinners and you're afraid to say the name of Jesus because you think you might lose friends. That's a big one. Self-preservation. You know, I have a whole bunch of friends and they're great people morally. They don't do crimes. They may drink a little bit. They don't do drugs. They don't get speeding tickets. They don't do any of those sorts of things. And I've kind of grown up with them my whole life. And I, I've been associating with them my whole life. And you know what? I just don't really want to say anything about Jesus because I might lose some friends. That's a huge one. That's a huge one. Kind of that love of being accepted in that circle you run in. And that's eternally disastrous. Because once again, verse 26 says, The Son of Man will be ashamed of you if you are ashamed of Him. That's disastrous to do that. I'll go back to Luke chapter 9. We'll spend a couple more minutes here in this latter part of this verse. In verse 26, For whosoever shall be ashamed of me and of my words of him shall the Son of Man be ashamed and We've looked at that. If you're ashamed of him today, he will be ashamed of you in the next life. But here's really where it's very detrimental because the latter part of that verse says that where he's going to be ashamed is when he shall come in his own glory and in his father's and of the holy angels. And that's just referring to the second coming. When the Lord Jesus Christ sets up his eternal kingdom, which is a literal, real, physical kingdom on this earth, it will be a time of judgment. Daniel chapter 7, Daniel chapter 12, Revelation chapter 20, all kind of record that, that courtroom setting, if you will. All of those passages, all of the prophetic books, Ezekiel, Daniel, Jeremiah, and Revelation, they all talk about books being opened when Christ begins to judge. And what are in those books? Well, there's the book of life that has everybody's name in it, but there's also another separate uh, uh, set of books that the psalmist talks about and all of the other prophets talk about. And, and those books are the books of every single individual deed and thought and act anyone has ever had. Uh, that's what you'll be judged out of. Those books will be opened. And your life will be exposed before the full blazing glory of the Son of God who will stand in front of you and judge you for not being ashamed of yourself. It will expose every deed, every sin, everything that we have ever done. I want to tell you, we have a lot to be ashamed of. Yes, we're saved. Yes, God's given us grace. Yes, God has changed us. Yes, we're going to heaven. 
But before a life ever even entered into our hearts, we had a lot to be ashamed of. Uh, that's one of the, the, the greater realizations in my life and how I got saved in a county jail on my knees crying out to God. Because I, I, it just the light came on that my entire life I had been living for myself in such a selfish way and hurting everybody around me, even my family and everyone included, but most of all, I had literally been breaking the law of God. And in that realization, at that moment that I was a sinner and I was crushed under the law of God and I didn't even want to lift my head up because I was so ashamed in the light of a holy God that I had lived my entire life and literally turned my back on the sacrifice that He sent down into this world and that was His Son. I mean, think about how offended holy God would be that would make such a extreme sacrifice of sending his only son to die for humanity and humanity just walks by him every day. That's what saved me. The guilt. The feeling that I had broken the law of God. I was ashamed of that. I was ashamed of that. Every thought I had, every deed I ever did, Every attitude I ever had, it was all for self before I was saved. And you know what? I really think that the church kind of plays into this, this cultural thing. And I, I like to use this term a lot when the church becomes like the world. And, and I think it happens in an innocent way. But I think it happens from the pulpit. And I think this whole matter of getting saved really comes down to the conscience. And that is that sinners have learned to convince themselves that they're not guilty before God. They psychologically convince themselves that if they donate a little bit of money so they can get some tax returns, or whatever they think is righteous and good works, they, they figure that if they do these things and still admire Jesus from a distance, that somehow that erases their culpability that they're still guilty before God. You know, the church does play right into it. Because we make them feel so comfortable, we don't give them the real heart of the message that's meant to strip them down crush them under the weight of the law of God, and then rescue them. We modify that whole message. And so what the church starts doing, the church starts adopting the message of the culture, and you start telling people, watch this, they can be whoever they want to be and do whatever they want to do, and it's okay, they have self-autonomy, and they're just going to do what they want to do. No, no, no. You can't just turn yourself into a female. Just can't happen. You're not designed like that. You can't just live in open sin and homosexuality, sin and wickedness running rampant and just think that you're okay. And sinners have convinced themselves that they're okay. And they're not guilty before God. And if the Bible brings it up or if a church person brings it up, they're being hypocritical or judgmental. No, we're trying to rescue you. And here's where it gets harder. You really do have two different groups of people who are not shameful. You have the open, blatant, wicked, wretched, sinful people who just live in that muck and mire of drug addiction and criminal activity and they're not shameful for anything they do because they've convinced themselves that they're not guilty before God. And then on the other side of the spectrum, you know what you have? You have religious people. Religious people that think because they come to church, because they read their Bible, because they put money in the plate, that they're okay. And they're not shameful for anything. As long as I go to church, as long as I read my Bible, as long as I throw a little money in the plate, I'm going to 
going to be okay. And, and both groups have convinced themselves that they're not guilty before God because of the actions that they take and that erases their culpability in the face of God. And then the church plays right into that same hand and says, oh, you're a sinner? Oh, you're a transgender? That's fine. You're okay. No, you're not okay. You need to meet Jesus. Jesus will change you. Jesus will rescue you. Jesus will forgive you of your sins. As hard as that sounds, that's the message. You can't modify that message. You can't tone down the sword of God to try to convince people that they're okay because they're not. And that's what it really comes down to, this issue of are you ashamed of yourself and who you are and what you've lived? Are you ashamed of Christ? That's how you enter into the kingdom of you're ashamed of yourself. Now in this life, you'll be forgiven. Or he will be ashamed of you in the next life. Hard message, but it's the truth. It cuts right to the heart of all of these modern evangelical messages, these evangelists who teach that Jesus is this helpless, frustrated, would-be redeemer that's just waiting on everybody. Sinners are... I know I was... Sinners are very good at self-deception. I don't know if you've ever met an addict, if you've ever had an addict in your family. But one thing addicts are very good at, they're very good at lying. They're very good at psychologically trying to make everyone else feel guilty because of where they're at in their life. As sinners, they're real good at deceiving not only other people, but also deceiving themselves. The heart of the gospel is to get the sinner to see that he's been deceiving himself and he needs to come to the light. Religious people are the hardest people to reach with that message because they're already in the light, they think. With that, let us pray. Lord, we thank you for the words in Scripture powerful words that really do cut so deep. Words that at times it feels as though you're beating on us. But Lord, we know that it's in grace. We know that your word is a two-edged sword that it cuts going in but heals coming out. Lord, we're thankful for conviction. We're thankful for the Spirit of God who operates in our hearts, that communicates truth to us. Thankful that you allow us to be sensitive to your voice so we don't deceive ourselves, so we don't convince ourselves that we're well. Thank you for saving us, for never giving up on us, for always being there for us, for being our provider, or to help us to take a message to people who are lost. Help us to be concerned about the souls of people around us, people that are in our groups and our circles and our families and, and people that we come in contact with day to day. Help us not just to walk past them we give us the wisdom to speak to them in a graceful manner, in a truthful manner, in a way where they're exposed to the real message of the gospel, where you're able to work in their hearts. Give us that confidence, that boldness to do so. We love you and we thank you in Jesus' name. We're going to finish off with song 355, 355. Would y'all stand? What a friend we have in Jesus. <laughs> Oh.
safe next Sunday. We ask you in your son's name, Jesus Christ. Amen. 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 